Hey, this one's on the Cold War. During the second half of the 20th century, the world's two major powers were engaged in a face-off without direct confrontation for almost 45 years. Let's trace on a map the chain of events that shaped the Cold War. I'm here for it. At the end of World War II, major European powers are weakened after more than 60 million deaths over six years of fighting. Two superpowers remain in the world, the United States of America and the USSR, who fought together as allies to defeat Nazi Germany and the Empire of Japan. The USSR, or the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, is a vast area covering one-sixth of the land surface of the planet. It is a federal state under a communist regime consisting of 15 republics and headed by a single party. The United States of America is a liberal democracy based on capitalism. It has a military edge being the only power with nuclear weapons and also boasts the world's strongest industry and economy. Both powers try to peddle their influence in Europe. The US, under its Marshall Plan, offers substantial loans to European countries to revive the economy and establish trade links. The USSR, for its part, wants to protect its borders and set up pro-Soviet governments in liberated countries. Europe is found divided into two blocks and separated by what is called the Iron Curtain. In Germany, Allies merge territories they control in violation of agreements signed with the Soviets. In response, the Soviet Union imposes a blockade on West Berlin, which is still under Allied control. An airlift is set up to bring supplies to the area. I like the music he used. Henceforth, both powers harbor a fear of the other. On both sides begins a witch hunt. In the United States, federal employees sympathetic to communist ideas are fired. Even Hollywood is used as a tool to produce anti-communist propaganda. Movies are sometimes still used as a propaganda tool. I think the only thing that really changes about that is their angle every X amount of years. There's this documentary on, not Netflix, what's the other one? Amazon, called Propaganda, the Art of Selling Lies, something like that. But it gets into examples of propaganda from World War II and compares it to modern day. It's pretty interesting. Freddie Prince Jr. is in it. It's a bit random, but... USSR, any form of opposition is suppressed. Beyond ideology and clout, the two powers battle for influence in the fields of science, industry, space, sports and military. The Soviet Union invests heavily in industry and arms and in 1949 tests its first atomic bomb. The same year, the United States sets up NATO, a military alliance between countries of the Western Bloc. Throughout the Cold War, there would be many indirect confrontations between the two powers and their allies. The first one takes place in Greece, where a rebel communist militia from the Second World War, supported by the Soviets and armed by Yugoslavia, enters into a civil war against a traditional monarchist party, supported and financed by Britain and then the United States. However, following tensions, the USSR breaks its alliance with Yugoslavia. As a result, Greek communists lose vital support and are forced to lay down their arms. Greece then becomes part of the Western Bloc. Isn't it crazy how, well, crazy isn't the right word, interesting how much NATO has expanded from 1949 and then looking at all of the implications of each country geopolitically because it started with what, 12 countries, now it sits at 30 or 31? Actually, that's a real question. In 2023, I'm not sure how many countries are part of NATO. You'll have to let me know. China, after three years of civil war, the communists prevail over the nationalists who retreat to Taiwan. The USSR wins an important ally in the region that would influence two wars in particular. The first was fighting alongside communist North Korea against South Korea, which was supported by a UN-led international force directed by the United States. After three years of fighting, a ceasefire leaves the Korean peninsula divided in two. China also intervenes in French Indochina, where it supports a rebel communist militia against France, which after struggling to regain control of its former colony, is forced to leave the region. Vietnam is divided in two at the 17th parallel, with communists in the north and nationalists in the south supported by the United States. 
This marks the beginning of the Vietnam War. In response to NATO, the USSR organizes its own military alliance through the Warsaw Pact. The following year, France and Britain unite with Israel in a surprise war against Egypt to regain control of the Suez Canal. The United States and the USSR oppose this attack and quickly impose a ceasefire, marking the end of European dominance in the region to the benefit of the USSR. The Soviet Union, which has now caught up in military and industrial technology, installs hundreds of long-range missiles pointed at Western Europe. In response, the US points its missiles towards Soviet territories. Following disagreements, China breaks its alliance with the USSR as the country aims to distance itself and become a new world power. On the other hand, many countries break with the two main camps and choose to remain neutral by creating the non-aligned movement. In Latin America, the United States plays its part to ensure no room for communism, but the country fails to militarily overthrow the new communist government in Cuba. How many times has the United States interfered in Latin American countries in the name of communism? Why did I say that like that? Communism, on some level. Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Honduras, Guatemala during the time of the Banana Republics. There's such a long history there. The USSR takes advantage of the American failure to diplomatically influence Cuba. Soldiers and Soviet military ships are sent to the island and missiles are installed and pointed at the US. Tensions build to a point where the marine forces of both sides get ready to face off against each other. The whole world holds its breath and many countries prepare for an eventual World War III. But after negotiations, the USSR agrees to withdraw and remove its military facilities if in return the US promises not to attack Cuba and removes its missiles in Europe. This de-escalates the situation. In Vietnam, the United States, fearing a communist takeover of the South, organizes a military invasion with more than half a million soldiers. This decision antagonizes France, which prefers to find a peaceful solution. France decides to distance itself from the increasingly assertive United States and leaves NATO. In 1975, communists win the war, inflicting a heavy defeat for the United States, whose image is tarnished globally. The USSR took this opportunity to revive its political influence in the world. On the one hand, it supports communist militias in Africa, which takes over power in newly independent countries. On the other hand, the country sends its army to Afghanistan in support of the communist regime fighting the Mujahideen, a group of Islamists supported and funded, among others, by the United States. The USSR also upgrades and replaces its missiles directed towards Europe with more precise ones. This marks the beginning of the Euro missile crisis, which threatens Europe and pushes the United States to install new missiles of its own. This sparks an arms race, with the USSR investing up to 14% of its gross national product on the cause. The Soviet Union begins to run out of money. At the height of the crisis, it tries to implement economic reforms, but to no avail. The two global powers eventually meet to begin disarmament negotiations. The USSR withdraws from Afghanistan and stops funding communist militias in Africa. It attempts to open up to reforms and boost transparency, but it is already too late for the Soviets who can no longer quell multiple revolts. The Berlin Wall is destroyed and Germany is reunited. In 1991, the USSR implodes and the 15 republics become independent states, marking the end of the Cold War. very clean chart and I think he explained easily enough it was digestible this was a video from a channel called geo history thanks for sending it in I haven't seen anything from this channel before but I see on the ending cards that they have another video on Napoleon that I want to check out and on petroleum which is a subject that interests me in my off-camera life in real life so there's that it was just an overview though so feel free to add or expand on any of the points that he brought up. There were some things in there that I wasn't completely sure about, so I have things to look into after this. 
And as with any history video, it's hard to come out of it without some points that could be argued. And I think we see that a lot in any of the history videos that we cover. I think a bit of it has to do with being taught from different countries, so we have different viewpoints, or as our understanding of history evolves, some people believe X, others Y, I don't know. It's probably a myriad of reasons. Anyway, all things considered, I liked this video, so I will be checking out more from Geo History. We'll see if they have any World War videos, World War One or World War Two. And for a literary recommendation, I've got two in my head. One is Our Man in Havana, which is a satirical novel about a British spy. It must have been written in the late 50s, early 60s. But I always like a spy novel, and that one made me laugh, which books don't usually do. So I will make sure to link it in the bio for you. And another one is a bit more serious, which is Manufacturing Consent by Noam Chomsky. And for me, Noam Chomsky is a pretty good example of someone who I don't agree with always, which could be said of anyone. Really, there's no one that I agree with 100% of the time. That includes my friends. But I do find value in his writing, and I think he's a good author. In this book specifically, he gets into U.S. propaganda as used by the media and how that affected Latin American countries and other countries as well. And... It uses case studies, which gives it a level of legitimacy, but also kind of makes some points in that book a bit dense to read. But I still recommend it because after reading it, I realized how many people reference manufacturing consent in politics, in culture. So if you've read it, leave your thoughts. Or if you have another book on the Cold War that you want to recommend to the channel, let us know in the comments. Other than that, drop anything that this made you think about, and thanks for watching with me.